Good morning, everyone. My name is Audrey Davis, and I am the president of Virginia Africana Associates, a network of museum and preservation professionals dedicated to the accurate interpretation of African American history throughout the Commonwealth. I want to thank you for attending to our second webinar uh, in the Amplifying the Silences in African American, of uh, Amplifying the Silences of African Americans in Virginia series. Today's webinar focuses on teaching African American history in Virginia. But before we start, just a bit of housekeeping. All of our participants will be muted during the webinar, but you can place questions in the Q&A, and I know that several of you have, have begun to do that already. Before we begin, I also want to thank Virginia Humanities for supporting us with this collaboration and our second webinar. We were founded under the auspices of Virginia Humanities in 2000, uh, to over 10 years ago. And while we have become independent in 2016, we value our long-term relationship with Virginia Humanities and all of the incredible, amazing staff members that form that organization. We also want to give a great deal of thanks to Trey Mitchell, who is handling our tech support for the webinar. And we are very dedicated to him for his uh, unwavering support and answering of our many, many questions. Today, I'd like to introduce Justin Reed, who is the Director of Community Initiatives for Virginia Humanities and a manager of the General Assembly African American Cultural Resources Task Force and a great friend. So now I'd like to turn it over to you, Justin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you, Audrey, and also just thank you, Virginia Africana Associates, for hosting this important event. Um, for, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with Virginia Humanities, we are one of 56 uh, U.S. and territory state humanities councils, and we have been committed to uh, helping Virginians preserve and share and teach our history and culture for nearly 50 years now. Um, we were established in 1974 by the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is a federal agency. And I guess one thing that I just simply want to say is that, you know, this conversation couldn't be more timely. Uh, we've seen what happens when uh, these you know, historical myths and, and you know, founding fiction go unchecked. And I think the work of the commission that was established by Governor Northam is really doing just important preventative work so that we can truly strengthen our democracy and truly perfect our union. And so thank you to Virginia Africana Associates. Thank you for the leaders of the commission who we're getting ready to hear from today. Um, the work that, that all of you are doing, I mean, just couldn't be more vital to our society and, and to our communities. And I'm going to now uh, turn things over to uh, Dr. Lornette Lee, who is a, a leader in both organizations, both Virginia Humanities and Virginia Africana Associates, and um, an incredible historian and, and educator and Professor so Lornette. Thank you, Justin, Audrey, Trey. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. These words written by James Weldon Johnson in the turn of the 20th century speak so profoundly to where we are today. And it speaks directly to our mission, the Virginia Africana, as well as the Virginia Humanities. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to our speakers today. Dr. Rosa Atkins. Uh, is superintendent of Charlottesville City Schools. In 2011, she was named Virginia Superintendent of the Year by the Virginia Association of School Superintendents, as well as Virginia State University Alumna of the Year for Professional Education. In 2015, 2016, she served as president of the Virginia Association of School Superintendents and She's been recognized by the United States Department of Education as one of 100 future ready superintendents in 2014 and invited to the American Association of School Administrators Digital Consortium at the White House. 2017, Governor McAuliffe appointed Dr. Atkins to the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, also known as CHEV. 
Uh, she serves as a board executive board member and mentor for aspiring superintendents for AASA, Howard University Superintendents Academy. And she is an alumna of Virginia State University and Virginia Tech. Dr. Derek Aldrich is a professor in the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia. He is the director of the Center on Race and Public Education in the South. And he also directs the Teachers in the Movement uh, project, which is an oral history project that explores the ideas and pedagogy of teachers during the civil rights movement. The aim of the center is to bring researchers and local community together to examine the intersection of race, education, and schooling in the South with the ultimate goal of influencing education policy. He joined the uh, faculty at the University of Virginia in 2001 after teaching for many years at the University of Georgia. And I hope Many of you were with us in October when we debuted our webinar series with Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. She is Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University, where she is also a professor of history and director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for African Diaspora Studies. She earned her BA in American Government and Amer African American Studies from the University of Virginia and her PhD in American history from uh, William and Mary. She was a project director of the 1619 conference series. She served in various academic and civic roles, received numerous grants, consulted with community groups and has published extensively. She's also been involved in the American Evolution Initiative. Um, and her work on this commission is what led us to bring these three scholars together today. Hear ye, hear ye. We'll start off with Dr. Atkins, who will bring us the charge and recent updates. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And I want to thank you for inviting us to present uh, to the Virginia Africana Association. We so appreciate you having us here and we want to applaud the work that you are doing and make ourselves available to support that work in whichever, however we may. I am now going to um, also welcome our, my colleagues and co-chairs of the uh, commission who will be presenting with me. And it's an honor to be on the stage with them. I'm going to share my screen now to pull up our presentation. I'll, um, let's do the full share. Here. I apologize for um, not getting the whole screen on. And I'm going to get help in just a minute to get it all on. Thank you. All right, so I'd like to, um, as, as Dr. Lee has said, Dr. Uh, Cassandra Newbery Alexander and Dr. Aldridge uh, both worked on the commission, uh, and it was a delight to have both of them uh, share the stage with them. This commission started on August the 24th, 2019 by an executive order from Governor Northam, the 39th executive order from the governor. And he tasked the Virginia Commission 
on African American history uh, with three different tasks. And I'll just briefly go over those three tasks. The first task was technical edits. And uh, if you know anything about the Department of Education and making technical ed edits or changes to the standards of learning, that can be a two year process. And that's an important note as we go through this presentation to make technical edits and recommendations for enriching the standards uh, related to African-American history. And that's in Virginia and the impact uh, across our nation. And then broader considerations for uh, the review process for the standards of learning for the full history and social studies standards. And that would be through K through uh, 12 in our school systems. And then necessary professional development uh, and instructional supports that would be needed in order to implement and to have fidelity to the recommendations for change. And what we, here we have uh, here we have a listing of all of the commission members. Uh, the commission members were, uh, covered a vast array of professionals from across the Commonwealth. Uh, we had uh, historians, uh, museum curators, school board members, we had parents, teachers, uh, we had uh, school administrators, superintendents, professionals. So we had an array of professionals from across the Commonwealth. We also had the Secretary of Education, Secretary Carney, and our Superintendent of Public Instruction, Dr. Lane. The commission actually began its work in the fall of 2019 and met several, uh, seven times uh, over the course of the following year. We were commissioned, uh, asked to bring back a report to the governor no later than 2020, uh, early in 2020. The subcommittee uh, of the commission met um, several times, did long days, long nights, long weekends in order to get the work done. Uh, and in addition to the meetings of the full commission. The stakeholders uh, who attended or listened in on those meetings uh, provided verbal comments or written comments. Uh, all of the meetings were open to the public and we had approximately 300 people who attended to the uh, listening sessions uh, that were held in Roanoke, Richmond and Norfolk. There were additional listen se listening sessions that were uh, scheduled, but because of COVID, those had to be postponed. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, who will go over the standards review committee recommendations. Thank you so much, Dr. Atkins. Um, I wanted to begin my presentation by uh, just reiterating uh, the, uh, the platform that Governor Ralph Northam put before the commission. By establishing this commission, it was his vision that Virginia would continue that legacy of pioneering a path forward. And you know that Virginia has had a very interesting legacy sometimes, pioneering a path forward in the wrong way, such as the enslavement of people of African descent or challenging efforts to integrate our schools. But at the same time, Virginia has pioneered pathways forward in talking about and laying the foundations for democracy in our country. And so it's with that intentional positive legacy, Governor Northam issued a directive that, that he wanted to ensure that all of Virginia's youths were educated to understand history and the legacies, especially of past wrongs that included seg slavery, segregation, and discrimination against a significant proportion of the population in Virginia, as well as Virginia's monumental contributions to American society. And what we were seeing in the current standards um, was an absence of the voices of African Americans in, in not only challenging the wrongs, but in contributing to the positive legacies of Virginia for the nation. 
as the co-chair of this commission, it was my job to lead the standard subcommittee that included make, uh, recommending technical edits, the standards review process, and the framework for future standards of learning that are accurate and inclusive. And the latter is critical because American historians um, our focus on revising the narrative to be inclusive, accurate, and balanced. But of course, what we were seeing in the standards for a long time was the opposite. I remember when the standards first came out, there was not even a mention of the word slavery in those standards. And then when there was a mention, uh, it just was not sufficient. So um, as you all know, um, a lot of progress, as I said, has been made, but the effort really on our part was to try to target uh, areas where there was clearly a political agenda in retelling the history from the perspective of this master narrative. Uh, and for those who don't know what the master narrative is, it is uh, something that historian Ronald Takaki in his book, A Different Mirror talked about, that there's this master narrative that said that Europeans helped to create this country, that all the positive things that came in the evolution of this country was by Europeans and America essentially was uh, a country uh, created by and developed for Europeans and everyone else is kind of an add-on. And so it's changing that master narrative and presenting history with a richer and more expansive representation of our shared past. And next slide, please. So when the commission first convened, we were told that the standard practice from the Department of Education was to define the technical edits using, using the following standards, uh, a correction of inaccurate information, a clarification and editing of incomplete statements, and a revision of grammatical errors. And so we wanted to make sure that as we approach these technical edits, that we would actually um, ensure that we adhere to those standards. Now, of course, um, the expansive charge really was that we had to do three things simultaneously. So we asked historian Ed Ayers, who graciously agreed to really, he was the only one going through all of the standards. And if you've read the standards in social studies, you know that was a monumental task to go through and identify all the areas that he thought could fit under those guidelines that the Department of Education had for technical edits and to make certain adjustments. But the other two uh, working groups were um, uh, focused on the overall picture. So if we're going to approach um, the standards, what would that approach be? And then another uh, working group was looking at what are the um, what are the main themes that these new edits uh, or these new standards should incorporate so that we're not trying to amend the master narrative, but instead to go more in concert with how the historians have been presenting information. So we recommended a thematic approach to retelling uh, the content so that students um, could really easily, more easily make connections. Uh, the best way to get students to make that connection is to start with the present and work your way back. And these, there are themes throughout American history that we identify. We also wanted students to develop a deeper understanding, a more comprehensive understanding of African American history in the larger narrative. And that had to start at the kindergarten level. Next slide, please. So when, once we put um, the standards forward, uh, we were told by uh, Superintendent Lane that um, the standards should go to the, um, uh, to the state school board. And so we actually made the presentation to the state school board uh, to look at the technical edits. And of course, we proposed that uh, there should be a revision in the standards review process. And we looked at, as I said, 10 key concepts in history and social studies um, to ensure that 
we didn't just gloss over history and gloss over African Americans in American history. Next slide. We also, by the way, wanted to make sure that everyone, not just those who are interested, but everyone who's certified in social studies um, has uh, found, excuse me, has gone through some sort of certification. Uh, because if you just have a handful who are teaching this kind of history, um, then you will have other people continuing to teach the master narrative. And so we recommended that all of Virginia's teachers who are teaching uh, American history be certified uh, with these particular um, understandings and competencies. So the technical edits work group um, and our work was summarized with the following. And that is that we wanted to make sure that um, African-American, uh, that the background, that people do not see African-Americans as a monolithic group. Uh, typically in a lot of uh, general narratives, um, African-Americans could be male or female. And the two were just pushed together uh, for as long as America is, has existed. We've always had both free blacks as well as those who were in bondage or slavery. Um, but instead, that whole group has been scrunched into one. Um, there have been some who have done well um, and some who were struggling in poverty. Uh, the neighborhoods were different. They were varied depending upon where they were located and the kinds of influences that came into those neighborhoods. And so we wanted a much more diverse, much more human approach to teaching African-American history, not just um, uh, a very monolithic approach that often dehumanizes people. We wanted certain historical figures, um, not just, I called them the big three, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, there were many, many, many more African-Americans uh, who had a tremendous impact on American society and culture. And, and that's not to say that the three that are typically mentioned didn't have a significant impact, but we wanted the diversity of voices to be represented in what students heard and learned. And we wanted the terms and content relevant to African-American history, as I said earlier, to be introduced at the very beginning so that um, the, the, the process of, um, of creating these negative stereotypes didn't get embedded in the very early years, but rather um, we countered that with information even in the kindergarten through 12th grade period. And we wanted to um, correct a lot of the information on topics of slavery and abolitionism, reconstruction, lynching, and a whole host of other things that were either omitted from history uh, or from the standards or completely distorted. Next slide. So the 10 concepts that we said the new standards should be guided by included the 10 things that you see, such as freedom, imperialism, colonialism, racism, capitalism, citizenship, servitude, advocacy, cultural expression, and invasion. And typically, especially when you look at words such as imperialism or invasion, uh, or even racism, uh, there's been a reaction against that. In fact, there was a recent uh, study done just before President Trump left office that countered all of these things. Of course, they had no basis in historical fact and historians have blasted uh, this study uh, saying that it was a work of fiction. Um, but these issues really help us to understand American history. Next slide, please. So we also um, recommended a revision or elimination of standards that were simply inaccurate. 
uh, out of date in terms of where historian narr historical narratives are and interpretations. Um, and we wanted the securing of funds for professional development so that educators can really be prepared. We know that in most of uh, the universities in the Commonwealth and beyond, uh, a person can take American history and know nothing, nothing about African American history because they're being guided by the master narrative and the faculty who are teaching it are guiding, guided by uh, a lot of the, the master narrative. Well, we wanted to make sure that these individuals who have the responsibility of helping to educate our youth also be educated about this most important topic. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we wanted to do or one of our recommendations was to expand the number of educators and external content experts so that the standard revision is not so much guided by uh, political agendas, but rather by facts and by those experts who understand history. We wanted a steering committee um, comprised again of these content experts to review the content and recommend the standards process. We wanted um, there to be an outreach to the general public and to parents and to ensure that all perspectives are vetted before the decision is made. Next slide. Now, before I end, I want to just say that um, the working groups that I oversaw were incredible. And I know Dr. Atkins mentioned that. Um, I wanted you to know that these individuals committed at least five to six hours in six different meetings to going over line by line all these standards. And these individuals who are professionals in their own right did it without compensation, without anything other than a a hearty thank you. Um, and so it tells you that the commissioners were really committed to ensuring that their work in a positively impact this process here in Virginia. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Newby Alexander. I'll now ask Dr. Derek, uh, Derek Aldrich to um, continue the presentation. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Atkins and Dr. Nubi Alexander. Um, and also thank you, Virginia Africana Associates for providing us with an opportunity to talk about uh, the very important work we were doing on this um, commission. Uh, I served as the chair of the professional development um, committee. Uh, let's go to the first slide. All right, the professional development subcommittee uh, had six priorities or six uh, priority legislative recommendations uh, for the purpose of ensuring Virginia educators could achieve proficiency in culturally relevant teaching and gain uh, appropriate foundational knowledge in African American history. And why is this important? Uh, just as the, the committee's work began, I received an email. I mean, I just couldn't believe I received it right before I went to our first meeting from one of my former students and teacher Ed, who is getting certified in social studies. And let me just read to you what she said to me. She said, as a first year educator, I am finding that I am running into racial and cultural issues in the workplace. In efforts to educate myself and be proactive, I was wondering if you had any reading for educators regarding race, ethnicity, and African-American history. I want to learn more about the Black child's experience and about African American studies and history. Now, this is a student who I advised, but she never took a course with me. But you can go through a teacher education program and not take any courses on African American history or African American studies. And it was having a negative uh, impact on her. So that kind of guided my thinking as the chair of the um, Committee for Professional Development. Uh, and here are our priority legislative recommendations, and then I'll go into some detail of those. Number one, we suggested the revision of Virginia's teacher evaluation regulations and uniform performance standards for school leaders to include cultural proficiency uh, efficacy. And this recommendation came from a number of the uh, administrators and school leaders on our commission, and they thought it was very important 
for administrators to receive cultural proficiency training as well. And we all agree. Number two, require every Virginia educator to certify that they have enrolled in cultural competency professional development by 2022. Uh, this was, was one that was straightforward. We were, um, there was no disagreement on it whatsoever. And uh, it was very, one of our, our very important ones. Next, what I think was, you know, extremely important recommendation, that was the allocation of funding because, you know, without funding, uh, it's hard to make any of these recommendations um, come to fruition. So we uh, suggested the allocation of funding and personal resources to develop, it, develop and implement comprehensive professional development in the areas of cultural competency and African-American history content for Virginia uh, educators. And we were very um, you know, specific about saying that it needed to be directed to African-American history content as well as cultural proficiency, because you can have all the content in the world, but if you don't have a framework, the correct framework to teach African-American history, it's gonna be problematic. Number four, mandate certification, continuing education units in African-American history for holders of education licenses issued by the Virginia Department of Education. And we wanted that to include initial licensure and renewals. Number five, amend the requirements for licensure endorsements in history and social studies to require evidence of course and course study in African-American history. And um, you know, that came from you know, discussions that all of us had about the need for this, but also, you know, I read what the student just told, uh, said at the beginning of my, uh, at the beginning here, and these students have almost no training in African American history. Uh, and number six, require a credit in African American history as a new requirement for graduation in Virginia. Uh, this new elective course in African American history uh, would be developed by VDOE and WHRO and this could be used to fulfill this requirement. So these were our six um, uh, priority recommendations. And throughout the process, we um, decided that we needed to think about the terms that we were using. And so I'm gonna go over some of the terms that we use and what they mean and how they apply to, what, to our work. Uh, one of the general recommendations though, was to establish a minimal criteria for state approved professional de development in these areas, culturally relevant teaching, which we define as the acquisition of curriculum and pedagogical knowledge, uh, recommendation in cultural proficiency, in other words, the mastery of uh, being proficient in issues of culture, uh, culturally responsive teaching, which takes it a step further when we're talking about the actual application of this knowledge. We also um, drew on the work of Ibram Kendi and um, putting forward this idea of anti-racist education as being a part of that general recommendation. And of course, African-American history would be at the center of it in terms of content and pedagogy. Next slide. All right, so culturally responsive practice. Uh, what, are, what should be the expectations in Virginia? So we propose establishing expectations for Virginia's educated workforce that are critical to support an effective delivery of professional development and are framed into four quadrants. One, culturally responsive schools, culturally responsive leadership, educators, and pedagogy itself. Next. And so what do we mean by culturally responsive schools? We debated this for some time, and I'm gonna provide you with just a few ideas that we developed or that we came up with. Uh, first and foremost, safe, inclusive and secure environments where all students are firm, are critical uh, for culturally responsive schools. And culturally responsive schools should also uh, have systems in place to mitigate racial or cultural tensions. And you can see the others that we have here. Okay, next slide. What do we mean by culturally responsive leadership? And these um, uh, points were uh, established, put forth by the administrators and leaders on our committee. And just a few of them include uh, that leaders should deploy resources and professional learning opportunities to advance cultural proficiency. Uh, they should also 
also establish high expectations for all students. And they should establish mentoring practices for new teachers and staffs, staff in culturally responsive pedagogy and practice. And I'd just like to reinforce that those ideas were uh, developed primarily by the uh, school administrators on our committee. Uh, what do we mean by culturally responsive educators? First and foremost, those educators that reflect on their own cultural lens. Second, uh, a, a second one would be those educators that recognize and redress bias in the system. And another would be uh, educators who are change agents for social justice and academic equity. And for culturally responsive teaching and pedagogy, a term that we use throughout our, throughout our conversations, we developed a, a three-pronged approach to it. And those approaches would revolve around institutional, personal, and instructional approaches, all right? So institutional would recognize a need for reform of school policies based on cultural factors. Personal would require teachers to become culturally responsive and instructional would provide educational materials for culturally, culturally affirming and aid in delivering culturally responsive instruction. Okay, we'll go to the... Uh, so I'd like to just highlight some of the general uh, recommendations and highlights of the work of our uh, Committee on Professional develop Development. And one, we wanted there to be a broadening of the teaching pipeline to seek out and tra train diverse teachers. Uh, two, develop models of training about implicit bias and culturally responsive pedagogy. And uh, another very important one was the development of a model of anti-racism educator uh, policy that would be approved by the Virginia Board of Education. And as you can see, we have uh, two other recommendations, but those are kind of our general recommendations. Okay. All right. So I will uh, stop here and turn back over to Dr. Atkins. Thank you, Dr. Aldrich. As you can see, the, the recommendations from both the Standards Committee and the Professional uh, development Committee are extensive, they're comprehensive, and they are uh, wide sweeping. And to implement those uh, recommendations would be a game changer in the Commonwealth of Virginia and how we educate our young people and how we prepare uh, educators to teach uh, in our school system. This quote from Ralph Al uh, Ellison is, is, uh, exemplifies our thoughts as we have approached this work. If you could show me how I can cling to that which is real to me while teaching me in a way into the larger society, then and only then will I drop my defenses and hostility and I will sing your praises and help you to make the desert bear fruit. So let's talk about now, where are we? Uh, what what was the response of the Virginia Board of Education and what has the um, General Assembly, what's their role in these recommendations? They're in session right now and, and will they play a role in, in um, accepting or moving forward these legislative points in the recommendation? We are pleased to tell you that on October the 16th, the commission made a, a report to the Board of Education and the Board of Education has approved the history edits from the African-American uh, Commission, the history and the social studies edits to the standards of learning. And that was a historical day. Uh, not only did they implement a new process, but they also uh, quickly gave their thumbs up, gave their approval to um, those history edits and standards um, that were the recommendations that were made. And we were extremely pleased with the action of the school board, with the action of Dr. James Lane in moving that forward and many, many other people who supported the recommendations. Now, will the General Assembly, what's their role? They also are active in moving this, the recommendations forward. Senate Bill 1196 is now making its way through the General Assembly, as well as House Bill 1904. There are four major components of those bills. And you've heard the presentation. And in summary, 
it is to our delight that the General Assembly is recommending that uh, teachers and anyone who holds a license in the Commonwealth of Virginia first have a cultural competency uh, portion in their evaluation, the uniform uh, performance evaluation of all educators in the Commonwealth of Virginia will have a cultural competency component. The second recommend um, a part of the ledger, the bill that's moving forward is that, um, that anyone who's intending to receive a license or to renew a license, that they complete instructional tra uh, training in cultural competency. So if you hold a license in the Commonwealth of Virginia, regardless of what you teach, what subject, that you must complete a course or training in cultural competency in order to receive a renewal of that license or an initial license. If you intend to major in history and receive a, a license to teach history or social science in um, the Commonwealth, that you complete a course in African-American history. And the fourth one is to require all school boards to require staff to complete cultural competency training every two years. The licensure portion happens every 10 years, but in the interim, all school boards will be required a continuation of professional learning for all of their staff in cultural competencies. Um, this is huge. The governor then took it one step further and the governor has appointed a steering committee to continue to look at, to review, and to revise the standards of learning uh, in history and social science. So that concludes our presentation. And we will uh, thank you to Dr. Aldrich, Dr. Newby Alexander, um, all of the commission members, and we are now prepared to answer any questions that you might have. I thank my colleagues for this wonderful and monumental work that you all have undertaken to bring about a much more inclusive uh, learning experience, not only for our teachers, but students and parents as well. Thank you so very much. I've got questions. Um, and we also have quite a few questions from our audience as well. So first, let me ask, how can the churches museums, sports, and other similar institutions play a role in promoting African-American history in Virginia's educational system? I certainly will be glad to jump in with that one. Uh, I, I would suggest that you start getting your uh, materials ready. You start getting um, uh, reading materials that represent all students. Uh, if we look at most of the reading materials that we have, um, it has that master narrative um, representation in those reading materials. So our churches talk about it, get a copy of this presentation, um, share it with your congregation, share it with your students. Let's rejoice at this time because this is the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, the recommendations of the, this commission and how they have been received and the, 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 um, the time in which it is taking to implement these and to pass these recommendations is historical. It was rapid. Uh, so that indicates that we are now in a different era. It's the best of times with this. So we would invite our clergy and our community to come on board and to tell our, our people and our communities about these changes. I, I would like to also add the following, and that is there are a number of, of incredible historians that are in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so one of the things that um, historic places, historic sites should do is invite some of these experts to come and do an analysis of their, of their information of how they present. Because there's a tendency, you know, and, and of course, it's, it's not unexpected, but there's a tendency of most museums 
<clears throat> and historic sites to um, look at that site and to present the information based on the master narrative. But if they can be, if they have an incentive, um, if they want to be inclusive, really inclusive, um, their incentive should be consult with an expert, get them to look at your site, get them to make recommendations. For example, uh, for a long period of time, all of the historic sites um, excluded any information about African Americans. I remember when I, I actually taught high school for four years while I was working on my dissertation. So, you know, I was an insane person during that period. And I took my students <clears throat> to some of the historic sites and, and, um, um, and houses in Norfolk uh, that were controlled and owned by the Chrysler Museum. And I specifically requested that they provide an inclusive discussion of that site because one of the sites was a big slaveholder in Norfolk. And the interpreter, after she went through the usual, she whipped out a piece of paper and with a lot of disgust started reading off something that someone had grabbed a hold of that talked about African-American history in general. And after that, I sent a scathing letter to the, um, to the head of the Chrysler Museum. And I said, I will never take my students back uh, unless you all change this, unless you provide real training to individuals when they are interpreting the site. It was not only completely insulting that she would do something like that. And I had a diverse group of students. It wasn't just African-American students. It was Asian Americans, white Americans. But I said, what did that person do to the students and their perspectives of this information that she, that this historical interpreter was so um, angered that she had to provide this information. And she actually said, and I was told I had to provide this information to you all. And, and so while that was a while ago, some of that still exists. And so that would be an important step. And there's pressure that can be brought to bear on these historic sites and museums and so forth. The other thing is, you know, write. Write to your congressperson, your senator, both at the state and at the federal levels and, and put in requests, demands, whatever, for this kind of inclusive information and funding to support it because typically legislators will say, yes, we support it, but there's no funding that goes with it. So if you do it, it's, it's on your own, but funding should accompany all of this and funding needs to accompany also having students able to go to historic sites and to see that information and to see that space. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of in Norfolk, uh, St. Mary's Basilica, which is the only predominantly African-American church, Catholic church in the nation. And they have an, act, they, I think they've concluded it, but they had an active dig on their site. And when I saw it, it was a tunnel. It was a three foot wide, four foot deep, um, lined with brick tunnel. And, and the church, Years ago, when it was rebuilt after the original site was destroyed and they rebuilt the church, they made sure that they preserved it. And while we didn't know at the time what exactly it was, I said, well, there were a lot of people who escaped uh, through the Underground Railroad. Well, we found out evidence that that's probably what it was because several of the members in that church were actively involved with abolitionism and with the Underground Railroad. And there's documentation to support this. So imagine what it would be like for students to be able to walk on that site, hear that story, and hear that one of the people who's in the church, Mary Levest, was the same person whose husband is the one who copied the plans for the CSS Virginia, which was the USS Merrimack, and got those plans to the Secretary of Navy, Gideon Wells to tell him that they're what the Confederates were doing and the fact that there was 
a, uh, an ironclad ship being developed and it helped to speed up the completion of the USS Monitor. Imagine the impact that that would have for students to actually go to that site and see the reality of it and to hear that narrative. So pushing for monies to be invested in allowing young people to go on these field trips and to hear this broader history that is, is really indicative of what was happening in our nation. Those are the things that I would say people should do. And you have a voice. Let me just say um, um, thank you, Dr. Newby Alexander and Dr. Atkins. Um, I would encourage um, the Black church and fraternities and sororities and community organizations to get their members and their children in the church involved in developing their own history by way of oral history. Um, a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to be trained by Dr. Lee in oral history methods. And um, she came to UVA and uh, talked to a group of educators about the utility of oral history, not only as a method of collecting data, but as a method of you know, telling us a different history. And, and uh, in other words, in a, in a, in a, in a, as a way of challenging the na master narratives, so to speak. So I can't think of a more powerful uh, way for uh, community organizations to get involved in the enterprise of history than to have their members, particularly the young children, involved in doing oral history themselves and creating uh, a challenge to the master narrative. Thank you all so very much. And let me add too, I think it's very important for us to make that connection between the young and our elders. Having our young people learn to listen and create oral history interviews of our elders because they will not be here forever and that history will be lost. Um, I'm reminded of um, James Weldon Johnson. We have come over a way that with tears have been watered. We have come treading the path through the blood of the slaughtered, out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. As Dr. Atkins said, we have come a long way. And as Dr. Nubia Alexander has snuck in that history lesson for us, there's so much that we do need to engage our, our young and old people with. And as Dr. Eldred said, that oral history is critical. Oftentimes we've been locked into the, the written narrative, but that oral narrative is just as important as well. Uh, we've got quite a few questions, but just let me ask this one. Where does the commission stand on the 1619 report? And what are your feelings about the previous administration's Saving American History Act of 2020? Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, so as, as we did our work, we were certainly aware of the 1619 project. I mean, it was everywhere, right? And so, I mean, it certainly influenced our thinking. In, in some ways, I would say certainly my, my, my committee, and I, I can't speak for uh, Dr. Alec, uh, Nubi Alexander's committee, but it did influence our thinking. But we were focused primarily on Virginia though. So um, I need to just be clear about that. It was in the background and it was important, but we were focused on Virginia. Um, one of the things that we were also tasked with doing is reviewing the course, the African-American history course that uh, WHRO was contracted to put together. And we looked through that and made a number of recommendations. And one of the um, recommended um, materials for students to read was from the 1619 project. Um, and I realized that there are some historians who've written a book challenging that I've looked at some of the major points which I wholeheartedly disagree with. Um, because once again, the 1619 Project has challenged the master narrative. And of course you're going to have blowback from that. But education is about looking at these different issues, having people have conversations. We seem to be at a point in society where we don't want conflict. You know, when conflict is in our faces um, 
and and in the area of education that's the space where you're supposed to have these conversations and differentiate between your opinion and what is factually provable yeah. and and so that's that, that I think is sometimes where we have lost our understanding with, um, I would say, a reaction to what is perceived as PC, uh, politically correct. And historians are not about being politically correct because the past is good, bad, ugly, and horrific. And if you're politically correct, you're going to write a false narrative. And so it's about looking at that, talking about it, and making sure that those points are discussed. And there's so much documentation to support a number of things that the 1619 Project put forward. And so that's why we recommend it that that material be incorporated in that course so that students can have the opportunity to read it and to talk with their instructor about what they read and discern for themselves based on research whether or not this has validity or not. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Atkins, did you want to add anything? I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with both of my colleagues. I think the discussion and the debate, we would not have been able to make these recommendations had we not challenged the status quo and challenged what has already been written and what has been taught for hundreds, a hundred years, uh, the narrative has been taught. And this commission was charged with challenging that narrative. Uh, and so we must continue to do that. You did it, you did it, thank you. Now I turn it over to Belinda Carroll, who is on the board of Virginia Africana. Belinda. There are quite a few questions. I'm trying to see if there is a way that I can consolidate some of the ones that are similar. Um, Michael Blakey asks um, about, he mentions the, the problem they found with the, I'm gonna try to move this, okay. The problem we found in the General Assembly's remembering project was that there was no commitment to teaching to the SOLs at the school district, school, or even classroom level there were not texts and the teachers felt at risk for teaching what they knew. How will we get this taught now? I think one of the important parts of the recommendation was that we not just leave it at the recommendations. Uh, even though we have two bills in the General Assembly right now that are going through and have met success in the Senate and in the House, and we anticipate that those bills will continue and become legislation, uh, but we can't stop there. The governor has convened the steering committee to continue to look at and edit and implement those recommendations in the standards. So though once they're rec uh, implemented in the standards, they then come out to the school division. Uh, an instructional framework is um, created that comes with the professional development committee. Also uh, commission recommended that we have experts in the field and we curate um, a, that steering committee start to curate resource materials that will be accessible to our teachers, to our staff in our schools in order to be able to fully teach uh, these recommendations. And so when we start to evaluate, uh, we always say uh, what you evaluate is what you're going to get. <laughs> you start to put in cultural relevance and cultural competencies as a part of the evaluation system, whether it be the licensure portion of it or the uniform performance standards. Once that's put in place, we've now set the tone that this is the culture that we want created in our schools and this is the culture that we demand. Hey, let me see. I'm trying to, once again, there, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> Try to get ones that I think will cover a few people. Um, are there any coordinated plans for vetting uh, digital resources, uh, whether for teacher training or for direct student engagement? Well, our, our, sub -com our committee did not do that work. We just made the recommendations, I think, um, as this moves forward, there will be some, uh, certainly will be some vetting 
of digital materials. So we didn't, we didn't get into that at all. We just made the recommendations. And, and my subcommittee made actually recommendations for uh, online materials uh, to accompany the course. Um, and these were materials that had already been vetted. Um, and so I'm sure that there is opportunity for a lot more. And that's why the, <clears throat> the recommendation was to include uh, a group of content experts so that they would be tasked also, not only with ensuring that the narrative is good, but also ensuring that the resource materials and, um, and all the accompanying materials for these courses are appropriate and accurate. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question from someone who teaches high school English methods at James Madison University. And they are into looking at ways to implement the new social studies mm -hmm. curriculum framework into their English curriculum. Will the commission also work to change and integrate the English and language arts curriculum frameworks? Well, I, my understanding and, and uh, Dr. Atkins and Aldridge, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was that this commission was step one in a longer process to be integrative across the board. And so we felt the weight of doing an excellent job in making our recommendations. Uh, but I understand that they're, that they're going to continue this process, uh, not only with other kinds of um, historical information, but also in the various fields. So looking at especially the area of literature um, to ensure it's truly integrative instead of you know following that pattern of the hundred most important works that are all white yeah. uh, as if the works of Ralph Ellison or James Baldwin or any of the others were irrelevant. Um, and so my understanding is they're supposed to, to actually follow through with that. And let's hope that the next administrations will continue that process. I'd also say that that um, it's important that we ask, continue to ask questions and challenge. Um, the Department of Education has a cycle in which they review all of the content standards. And in the review of those content standards, it comes before the State Board of Education. Our voice needs to be there. And we need, if, if it's not incorporated or there is not a movement to incorporate it, we need to ask the question, why not? And we need to make sure that we are there. The community's voices, the African-American voice is at the table when the decisions are made, attending the state board meetings, hearing the discussions and being a part of those discussions so that, that we, we don't let this ball hit the ground. We keep it in the air and keep moving these initiatives forward. Our children, our profession, our grandchildren, our culture uh, is worth it. Worth the time and energy that it will take to continue to follow through with these initiatives. Okay, there are a couple of questions about the implementation schedule and one specifically questioning about the 10 year timeline. And um, I, I, they're basically questioning whether or not the 10, year, 10 years is too long to wait for <laughs> some of these things, so. <laughs> I, and, and you get in trouble when you use um, professional jargon when you're doing a presentation. It's not a 10 year timeline. Oh, good. Teacher's license lasts for 10 years. So right. we get our license renewed uh, it is renewed for a 10 year period of time. So if I take the cultural competency course and I get my license renewed, uh, you, know, you may think you don't have to do it again for 10 years because I don't have to renew my license for 10 years. However, the safety net is that school boards will be required to have all employees engage in renewed training every two years. So we won't. So it's not a 10 year period. Every two years staff will be engaged. And hopefully even 
more often than that in many, many localities. Thank you for that clarification. There it looks like there's some more new questions. <laughs> Let's see if I can read these quickly. Um, Oh, they're asking whether, this is an interesting one because it relates to our African-American museums and historic sites a little bit. Um, would this group be involved in correcting the historical information or incorporating African-American stories into tourism brochures and websites and in tour guide training? No, that was not the, um, <clears throat> the charge given to the commission. I understand that there's another commission that the uh, governor has put in place uh, looking at slavery. And I would assume that that particular commission will be doing or recommending some of that kind of, of actual work. Um, and I did want to, I did notice a question in there about uh, training because this seems like there were one or two people who were interested in signing up to teach the African-American history class. And I understand that there will be a call for uh, more teachers uh, once they get past this early period, this, uh, tar this um, what is it, this, this uh, target period. Um, so look for that call for teachers. Um, Dr. Atkins, you can tell me when that will happen, but um, I know that it's probably coming up fairly soon. Um, uh, once this group cycles through, because I've actually been involved in helping to make presentations and talking with some of the students, not students, but teachers who are enrolled, um, who are the first group uh, pilot program teaching the course. And we do in Charlottesville, we are part of that pilot program uh, and individual uh, school boards have have accepted mm -hmm. the challenge of having that, um, letting their school divisions and their high schools be a part of that pilot program. As soon as we finish with that work, then that course will be a part of the offerings from the Department of Education and then everyone will have access to that work. Um, we started off with it being a general education course and in many of the school divisions, we've now moved it to uh, a weighted course, an honors course so that it will be alongside any other history courses that we have had. Thank you. There are two questions that are somewhat related. Uh, one person asks both of them and another person just asks one. Um, but there's a question, can you confirm that the cultural responsiveness, cultural competency and coursework includes a focus on our African heritage as a tool for rooted perspectives and strength and the other person asks whether this project would cover private schools and also asks whether or not it will integrate accomplishments from our legacy in Africa. Um, the, the, the course that was designed, yes, it does all of that. Um, and WHRO actually created specific content, um, virtual um, multimedia content uh, for different segments that included the African background that, I mean, you cannot talk about African Americans without talking about the African background. Um, and so, yes, that was there. I've forgotten the first part of your question. Oh, um, well, one person, there were two people who asked about that, mm. that whether or not Africa, how much of African uh, culture and history would be included. And then the the second person also asked about whether or not um, private schools would be receiving this curriculum. I think that's the, they're gonna make that available because this is an online class, um, but I don't know that it's going to be mandated for them. Thank you.
Um, and here's another question about um, it's saying that uh, the right revised and corrective narratives have not always been told by scholars and teachers. They've been told by genealogists and family historians. There are some other people who ask a little bit about oral history as well. Um, at what point will genealogists and family historians be invited to the table and have a voice? My understanding is that the content group of experts will include that group as well. And I just want to add that uh, the AUGS, African American Historical Genealogical Association, it now has chapters here in uh, Virginia, Hampton Roads and Richmond, I believe. Um, and uh, are very much engaged in reaching out to a broader audience. Shelley Murphy, the history girl in central Virginia is one of the people leading that effort. Um, there's another question. How might we apply these cultural competency um, concepts in graduate schools in public history and museum studies? Um, I can speak to that. Um, we're trying to do that at the University of Virginia with a new certificate and um, called an equity certificate. And we're hoping that this idea will spread around to other schools of education across the Commonwealth where uh, teachers can either take a course in a certificate or get the certificate itself uh, to integrate ideas of cultural proficiency into their, uh, into their teaching. So we're hoping that that will be a step one. Uh, a second part of that is we intend to offer this uh, the certificate online so people anywhere from uh, uh, throughout the Commonwealth can take it. Thank you. For educators who are um, currently teaching, um, what types of professional development will be provided? Uh, will professional development begin this school year or over the summer? Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that DOE, once these bills complete um, the General Assembly process, that it then will go to the Department of Education to start rolling out the professional development. So we anticipate that there are going to be school divisions that will take it upon themselves. Uh, and many are already underway teaching cultural competencies, implicit biases. Um, many of us, Charlottesville City is certainly one of them and many other school divisions. The Department of Education will help to establish some additional parameters for teaching them and expectations. And I anticipate that they will get um, start working on that as soon as the legislation is in place. Um, and typically, once the legislation is in place, we start to generate policy around it. Then we generate uh, the curriculum around it and the professional learning around it. And we anticipate that's going to certainly be underway this summer. A licensure renewal. I did see a question about that. Um, the cultural competency training and courses will be required for initial license and renewal. And if, and if you look at the uh, recommendations on our report, at the very end of the report, we uh, did kind of a preliminary list of, um, of institutions and organizations that we suggested might be able to provide some of that training. It hasn't been approved, but you can get an idea of what we were thinking. Thank you. Um, let's see. Does the commission plan a response to the 1776 report from the Trump administration? You said, do I have a, or do we have a response? Do we, do, do we plan to respond? Do we plan to respond to the oh. 1776 report? Um, I don't know that that's within the parameters of our directive, but I would, I would say that <clears throat> there are some historians who are starting to 
write um, a response nationally. I know that people like David Blight um, have already responded uh, with a note of dismissal um, in the firmest possible way. Um, and I, I don't know that it, it should have that much of a response just yet. I think what's more dangerous is a book that was published um, led by Peter Wood um, that sort of took down piece by piece the 1619 project, which of course completely erases a lot of work done by historians over the years. Um, I would say that so much attention should be um, devoted to that. And someone just put in that Biden has already dismissed this report, which of course I agree. <laughs> That's why I, I mean, it, there, there were no competent historians who were a part of writing that report. We have a question here about um, homeschools. So um, how would homeschoolers be um, affected or how could they participate? The um, curriculum uh, that we are recommending and the changes will be available on the Department of Education website uh, and they can access those materials of the curriculum, the standards, so that they may incorporate it in their homeschooling. Mm -hmm. and, and we would, I know in Charlottesville, we welcome our homeschool families to contact us and partner with us. And if they need materials or they need us to, to assist them in any way, we, we are available to them and to provide them support as they homeschool their students. Great, thank you. I will also add for our homeschoolers, they can enroll in just uh, an African-American course in our schools and remain a homeschool student. So they can select the areas in which they would like. And now that we know more about virtual education, uh, because of COVID, we, we, we have a better handle on that. There are more opportunities for homeschoolers to be involved in our public education system. We have a question about the format of teaching cultural competency. Is it lecture or passive learning or active engagement and interactive? You know, what I know about teachers is they, they take standards and they make it come alive. Um, they can make it come alive in lecture, hands-on, experiential learning. Uh, Dr. Nubi Alexander talked about visits to historical sites that has such um, complexity and richness in it. The educators that I know, those teachers in the classroom, they make magic happen. And when we have curricula and we have initiatives as rich as this, uh, the sky is the limit in how we present these materials and these, these initiatives and thoughts and, and truths to our students uh, and our communities. Okay, I think that has to be our last question. I, could I just add one thing? And that sure. is, we're in Virginia, the first state, excuse me, the first colony of America, the, the site of all of the important things that have happened in America. There are so many opportunities for teachers to bring history alive, and they have. And, but one of the, the, the hindrances has been a lack of being able to go out to these sites and to visit them and to go to museums and, and libraries and, and other areas that can interpret those sites properly, historically, and of course, inclusively. And that we're hoping that our work uh, is the first step in helping to make that happen. Thank you so much, Dr. Atkins, Dr. Aldrich, Dr. Nubi Alexander. This is one reason why the Virginia Africana board members wanted to bring you all to the audience of 
our uh, constituents, as well as the Virginia humanities. Now we will hear from Benjamin Ross, who's a board member of Virginia Africana, and our treasurer, Benjamin Ross, historian, Six Mount Zion Church. Uh, and a very good afternoon to all of us out there, to all of our panelists today. We really do thank you for that uh, wonderful uh, giving of information on the part of the commission, the Governor's Commission on African American History in the state of Virginia. Thank you so much for your very valuable time. To all of our participants out there, and a number of you have joined us today, we thank you for being with us as well. Uh, stay tuned to Virginia Africana Associates. We have uh, several more webinars and other topics to present to you uh, during the course of this year, 2021. Now I will ask you to consider supporting us. You know, I represent the African American church, so we got to take up an offering at some point in time. We ask that you will consider uh, supporting Virginia Africana when you get the chance uh, to help us continue doing the work that we are doing to preserve African American history here in the state of Virginia. We've made it convenient for you to uh, support us uh, through our PayPal account. Uh, you saw that uh, account uh, number on the link there. Just click on the link and you'll be uh, directed right into our PayPal account. We certainly do hope that you will consider that. However, if you're interested in uh, communicating with us directly, then certainly you can uh, uh, communicate with us here in Richmond, our official mailing address here in the city of Richmond, Virginia. Again, thank all of you for being with us today, this beautiful day in the state of Virginia. Thank you for the, all of the information that has been shared with us and we can take that information back to our prospective homes, schools, and institutions. And we ask you to uh, stay tuned to Virginia Africana Associates uh, for the balance of this year for more programs that we intend to offer to you uh, as we continue. We hope to hear from you. If you have some ideas, some comments, suggestions, we certainly look forward to hearing from you. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you to our panelists and to all of our participants and have a, have a very good day today. <music>